So I'm sorry. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, Billy and I were just talking about Cincinnati and um, brutalist architecture. And uh, Billy's hot take on Cincinnati is that it's way cooler than it has any right to be. So what's I, cool about Cincinnati? It's so me being like I studied urban planning and I studied history. I like urban history a lot. So it's one of those uh, it's one of those places. It was like the second round of moving across America. Like we got we got ourselves to the ports. We needed the oceans, but then you needed the rivers to get to the next place. So it really uh, it feels older than the place it is. Mm. In a weird way, it's yeah. it it feels it feels down to earth in a way. Right. You know, I would say the same thing about Detroit. Um, and I guess that that also makes sense because it's connected to the Great Lakes and it kind of has like that, um, I don't know, that like it, the time of the steamship was not that different from the time of the like, like sail ship, which gives it like a really old vibe because it could be sail ship era, but it's yeah. steamship era. I, I, well, clearly you see, I am currently wearing Detroit gear, so I am firmly, firmly pro Detroit. Right. It's it's that same kind of I, I mean, I just love a I love a Midwest city. It feels it. New York feels tall in the same way Chicago feels broad. And mm -hmm. I don't know how best mm -hmm. to explain that. But Chicago feels like a city city, you know, it, it does. It absolutely yeah. does. Uh, does Cincinnati feel like a city city? It's got it. Doesn't, it's definitely not as strong as Chicago is, but it feels it's got more of that, like, I don't know, an industrial revolutioniness to it, as opposed to either, you know, you look at New York City and you either have when they first got there or it is entirely right. brand enormous new stuff. Right. Yeah. But overall... So, so you studied urban planning. What was your degree in? Yeah, so uh, my degree, one, was in urban planning, and I had a, a degree in history as well. And the urban planning, that had a, a like a GIS component to it. So the uh, the work I'm doing now with Duke, uh, with Duke Energy, is, uh, it's all GIS work. So cool. a big... Uh, but urban urban planning was the thing that I like liked the most, <laughs> like combining so, together. So GIS is where you make maps, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what I do essentially, because I work, um, I work on the the natural gas team, and I have to justify. This is a brief aside. I have to justify to myself, like the work I'm doing helps like the, the people below me, right? It's, <laughs> I'm 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 helping out the guys out in the field replacing mains. I'm not helping, you know, CEO Lynn Good for the energy industry. I have to like remind myself of that as a uh, as That's a awesome. this age. That's really awesome. I like that. It's always good to know who you work for or like the purpose of your work and I like that the purpose of your work is like to help people who are giving people energy because the purpose of my work is basically just delivering to my boss what my boss needs yeah. or to a team of you know whatever yeah. in a telco company. So that's really cool. It is. Um, yeah. No, I was going to I was going to say it it does there's a little bit where you really uh most of my interactions are I am at like the the most technical level of things. So when stuff gets to me, it's usually from the people who are who are out in the field. And eventually, like you start to get to know these inspectors a little bit. Like old Kim Simonson absolutely puts out the best stuff every time, always the best documentation. So we're doing we're doing this for Kim and we're doing this for the linesman pretty much is is what's going on. <laughs> That's awesome. That's really really cool. So um, ab about your degree, uh, 
what overlap was there between urban like I can imagine that a lot of history is urban planning because like when I had to take my general credits like general education requirements I tried to take the most outlandish and bizarre courses that my college had to offer and I one semester I took a two classes, one in modern African art, like modern, African modern art, sorry. And then the other one was in, um, it was this class called uh, Pirates, Shipwrecks, and the Ancient Mediterranean, which sounds super, super cool, but it is all, it it was such a letdown. It was all about pot shards. That's the entire class. 100% of it was about examining pot shards and then trying to figure out what we can infer about the ancient economy and the way of life from like a piece of clay that's like this big, right? And like the amount of like, like inferences you have to make, like, oh, this piece of clay is very slanty. So (laughs) it's probably at the bottom of this pot that was shaped like this. And those pots were normally used for uh, transporting this type of oil from this region to this region. So we know at least that they had, you know, economic ties between that region and that region, which is probably why they had overlapping cultures and burials. And like, they just got like an entire, an entire society from like the slant of a pot shard. Right. Um, And by the way, uh, fun fact, this is like one of the things that I remember from the class. Uh, if you ever want to sound really smart in a museum, the way that you uh, date a Greek pot is whether or not the characters have ankle bones. If they have ankle bones, they're more modern. And if they do not have ankle bones, then they are older pots. And that's that's kind of the, the standard thing. That's, um, a, that's a fascinating distinction that... Did, did you find out why? Like uh, yes, yes, we did because um, a, I, I I can't remember which one it was, but like they used some type of paint um, that uh, normally what they did is they would paint the whole pot and then in relief they would show the images because the paint was really dark and then they figured out some way to make it the reverse so that the the um, figures were dark and the pot was like light. It might be the other way around, but as they figured out how to paint from being in relief to like actually painting the figures, that's when they added ankle bones. So. I'd like to imagine the one Greek artist who was just so stoked. Like, <laughs> I, I, I can finally draw these ankle bones. I've been wanting <laughs> here. It finally works. Right. Uh, Exactly. Well, the reason that I bring up that class is because the amount of information we got about society from like, like, basically studying the economy through very, very small pieces of evidence was pretty, pretty fascinating. And I can imagine that your degree really gave you the opportunity to understand the way that geography affects a culture. Right? That is essentially what got me into this like i have always been a huge human geography nerd since since freshman year of high school nice Uh, human geography was explained to me roughly as where people are and why they're there Mm -hmm. and when you look at it like that that's everything (laughs) right like you can trace back you can trace back these histories so, so far, and there's never an exact correct answer. Mm-hmm. That's one of the best things about both human geography and the history side of things, is that kind of in a similar way to making a bunch of inferences off of a single shard of a pot. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I'll, I'll read a correspondence between Alexander Hamilton and John Lawrence, and I have to determine exactly, you know, how they were feeling about each other in that present moment, what that had to do with that part of the Revolutionary War. Um, fun fact, they uh, Hamilton and Lawrence, in their conversations with each other, used to joke quite frequently about how big their noses were, which was a euphemism for penis. <laughs> did I did not know that. That's, <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. Yeah, there's Hamilton Lawrence fact for the day. <laughs> So, so did you like study American history mostly? Was that like the main thing? Yeah, my my primary uh, 
focus of study is American urban history. Um, I generally, a lot of the research I did had a, uh, a racial component to it. Uh, a lot, I did a lot of research on the city of Atlanta, which you and I both know quite well. Um, yes, we do. There's, uh, when you start looking into the history, I'll, I'll use Atlanta as an example because it's one that, I, that I've studied the most. And it's a place that I am originally from. Atlanta, to me, has always had a different feeling from other cities in the South. And, you know, me being from Atlanta, you being you being from up north, I'm, I'm curious of, of your perspective of these southern cities as well. But I I found Atlanta doesn't feel like, you know, it doesn't feel like Jacksonville. It doesn't feel like Charlotte. It doesn't feel like no. all of these places. It's got... It's got it also, more. go ahead. It also doesn't vote like Jacksonville or Charlotte, so. It does not. <laughs> Thank the good Lord above. But, um, but, so when you start looking back on the history of this place, you can start to figure out why. Like, Atlanta was the, uh, one of, if not the main industrial center of the Confederacy throughout the Civil War. It was, uh, Richmond, Virginia was also huge. Uh, but Atlanta was the site of, I believe, the largest Confederate arsenal. And it was also, like, the most crucial thing for uh, trains. It's the reason Atlanta is there in the first place is because they needed to connect Augusta, Georgia, and Chattanooga, Tennessee. And they found a nice spot in the middle. And so you look at that, and then you look at the people who came after Sherman burned the whole thing to the ground. There very few cities of that scale in this context got a fresh start like that. Like, you know, every city that's ever burned down is super happy to tell you about it. Like, if you've ever been to Chicago, you know, they're real happy to talk about how much that city burned down. But <laughs> they did it on accident. Like, Atlanta was burned down fully on purpose. <laughs> and... I think it's 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 led to this weird this weird dichotomy in Atlanta where you know you have the, one of the largest affluent black communities of any city in the United States sitting under the shadow of the largest confederate monuments in the world like the the fact that those two things can coexist in the same place and the fact that you can trace you know Atlanta is the busiest airport in the world and has been for since most of my life at the very least and you can see atlanta has always been a transport town it started as a train stop it can it grew because it was the center of the entire southern rail network right. and the largest airport in the world and there's you know little through lines that are so cool to me yeah, definitely. You raise an interesting point because most of those cities were established like, you know, when people were still using shipping as their main way of getting stuff around, right? But Atlanta in its essence is a industrial city because it was based on a railroad, which is an industrial product. Yep. And it was completely burned down in the civil war and had the opportunity to regrow much like, I don't know, like a, a North... I, I can't think of a city that was really built up around the 1880s. I, I don't know, but like it, it, yeah. it was like newer, right? Like it had kind of this new, fresh feeling, um, and in that way, it's always kind of been like a beacon of of like industry and and been like um, not based in like that antebellum Southern culture. It's based after it, right? Yeah, there's a there's a quote. Um, I believe this is uh, Mayor William Hartsfield of Hartsfield, half, one half of Hartsfield Jackson International Airport, William Hartsfield, uh, described Atlanta as the city too busy to hate. Um, it, he essentially tried to portray Atlanta and was to a certain extent correct. Atlanta truly was a more progressive city than most of its, most of its contemporaries in that area. That said, it's still the middle of Georgia. <laughs> like it's still the middle of Georgia in 1870. So it 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 got super 
I'm, I'm trying to think of the exact right way to phrase it, but that kind of modern rebirth, that kind of, it, it never wasn't an industrial city. It never. Right, right, right. Between types of things like New York, New York was a port city. New York has a huge port still, but that's mm-hmm. not what you care about New York for. You care about it for its financial sector. Mm-hmm. Right. Atlanta has nowadays is growing, you know, the, the, the economy of Atlanta is growing incredibly quickly as it has been for quite a while. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the things that, that come out from Atlanta, you have, you know, Coca-Cola for one yeah. example that just makes this this international global influence yeah and this is the first time it's ever had to do that like throughout the entire history of atlanta it was a railroad stop and then it was a really big railroad stop and then it was ashes and then it was another railroad stop and then it was the airport so right. like there's you they've never had to transition fully between different ways of being a city. They were never the same level of agrarian that everybody else in the South was. Got it. And it, it's left the whole area. And as you can see, if you look at the way Atlanta acts compared to every other city in the area, just right. it's different now. It, it left it permanently unique in a way that I have trouble. You can no. see it when you're there, but it's yeah. hard out why yeah i i definitely agree that atlanta is unique in character and the the geography and history of that city has kind of formed that character right um and that's interesting to to talk about on the scale of like a city or a civilization um i also remember uh, like one of the things that stuck with me from like my high school 12th grade english class was when my uh, teacher was talking about how having a fractured coastline was the thing that allowed greece to you know, have this renaissance of whatever and that like um, uh, cultures that have fractured coastlines with a lot of inlets for boats uh, tended to like develop and thrive and whatever, like like that type of thing. Um, uh, it, being able to trace the, the character of a civilization to the land that it's on um, is much, you know, it is pretty similar to uh, on an individual level, being able to trace like the character of a person to the the environment that they grew up in, right? Yeah. Like that's that's kind of like two two sides of the same coin, right? Yeah. Um. So, I uh, I'm, I'm moving to New York soon, oh. so that's exciting. Yeah. Tamid Ooh. got a job in New York, and it paid a lot of money. So we were like, oh yeah, let's go. And then we started seeing the housing costs in New York and we were like, oh, 100% of the extra income is gonna go to rent, but we're still gonna move to New York. That's funny, but now in New York. (laughs) Exactly. And there will be absolutely no difference in the standard of living, but. (laughs) Buildings will be taller. Buildings will be taller. Also, I have a ridiculous number of dogs and I'm gonna shove them into an apartment. So we'll see. That's that. That will, be, that will be tough. What is, did you know that they make porch potties? Have you heard of that? Okay, it sounds kind of disgusting, but it's like a little patch of grass that you can put on a porch, right? And then you can like put a little like slider thing in to like your slidey door that has like a dog door at the bottom so the dog can go out and go to the bathroom and I don't have to worry about like rushing home at five to take my dogs down the elevator. So I'm gonna be doing that. No, yeah, while objectively, a little gross. It's also <laughs> what doing play. Right, right, exactly. exactly. Burst your dog's kidneys because the outside isn't grass. Exactly. Like, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, the, my dog's not going to have their kidneys burst. My dog's oh. just going to pee in the house, right? Because that's what dogs do. And yeah. that's objectively more gross than peeing in a designated dog peeing area. So, <laughs> Although I will say, they, somewhat related, one of the very strangest places to go in any airport, and I'm glad they have it, is the pet relief areas. <laughs> That's, I've never been in a pet relief area. You have reminded me. I have only been in once, like, I wasn't with a pet. 
this I was traveling by myself and I had like a couple hours layover in Atlanta <laughs> and I found the pet relief area and I was like, I have seen that since I was born and I do not know what goes on in the pet relief area other than relieving pets. And then, <laughs> there wasn't much else, really. <laughs> there wasn't much else. It there looked out. Kind of like a little mini golf course. It was like the same turf. <laughs> Keep the dogs happy, I guess. Right, right. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I, you know, I actually really like the Atlanta airport. I like that they like put art in the, es- in the like, it's not escalators. It's like the tunnel. You have like the train tunnel, but then sometimes I walk the walkie tunnel and they have a bunch of art there about the history of Atlanta. Yeah, man. I, mm-hmm. uh, one of this, it's funny you mentioned that one of the uh, professors I had at Miami, mm-hmm. um, this was actually, sorry, this was actually through the uh, the honors program. He was uh, one of the people who advised me on a thesis I wrote about the city of Atlanta. Cool. Uh, he was responsible for that. Really? Like You know he, the guy who did that? That's that, insane. It was, and he was a huge research collaborator on the, history of atlanta that is up in the atlanta airport dude that's insane that's yeah. so cool i, I love that you know that guy yes i want to meet him me too <laughs> <laughs> you know, <a> whole bunch. <laughs> that's awesome yeah, yeah i that sounds super cool um yeah. hey so of all the cities in the united states do you think that some of them like in aggregate have better mental health than other cities Ooh, that is a very good question I would say it almost has to be true. Mm -hmm. And, and I say that both because of every, every city has its own, its own culture and that culture can contribute to your mental health. Obviously at the very least, people are going to be more sad in the winter in Fargo, North Dakota than they are in Jacksonville. Like that's true. At an incredibly baseline level, it's it's kind of what we've been talking about in people responding to their environment in the most literal sense of the word. Like, mm. if it's gray for six months. Yeah, no thanks. <laughs> people will have worse mental health. That's, that's statistically how that works. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Hey, so I just looked it up, and apparently someone did a study with a top 10 list. So, uh, the, is Youngstown? The, hang on, hang on. I'm trying, it's one of those annoying ass websites where you have to like scroll to get the list. And I'm really, I'm upset with, we might have to go to a different website. I might just, I might just not eh, too. Okay. Uh, so, um, the study found Denver to be the best city for mental health, followed by Salt Lake City, Utah. Tied in third place are Minneapolis, Seattle, and Hartford, Connecticut. Wow. Among the top 10 best cities for mental health are Baltimore, Providence, Rhode Island, Richmond, Virginia, St. Louis, Missouri, and Washington, D.C. That doesn't seem like... Where is this coming from? Who, who have they measured this from? Uh, this is Fierce Healthcare, and I'm going to put the link in our chat. Yes. <laughs> There's, there's no discernible pattern in that one. No. No. Between, I'm not so, sure, name two more dissimilar cities than Salt Lake City, Utah, and Baltimore, Maryland. <laughs> like, it, Why? What, are, what is the essential difference between Salt Lake City, Utah, and Baltimore, Maryland? Well, at the very least, uh, one of them's on the ocean, and the other one is in the middle of a desert. And That's true. One of them is completely ethnically homogenous, and the other one is not completely ethnically homogenous. Lake City is the ethnically homogenous one. Yes. What is the ethnicity? Uh, that would be white Mormons. White Mormons. Okay, cool. That's definitely it. I mean, obviously, this is an overgeneralization, but mm-hmm. uh, right. The the vast majority of citizens of Salt Lake City, Utah, are white Mormons. White Mormons. Yeah, no, that's true. That's just objectively true. Yeah. Okay. And so you can't attribute, according to this list, 
you probably can't contribute uh, attribute like rates of good or bad mental health to either a specific type of geography or um you know like a, a specific demographic or anything like that right yeah what what interests me i mean part of what i'm thinking uh, when you say st louis it surprises me it's high on the mental health index just because i know it is the city with the highest murder rate in the united states really and, yeah it is wow which these two things are not immediately computing in my head. <laughs> and so yeah. I lived in Richmond, and Richmond used to have one of the highest murder rates in the United States. Mm -hmm. This is actually... <laughs> this is quite fascinating. You got me interested. Um, What's going on here? Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's interesting. Well, first of all, I want to know how they measure mental health, right? Because, like, the, yeah. if they're doing it by the number of people who are on medication, that might just be a, like, a, a thing about the doctors in that area, and not necessarily be like something that actually reflects the the health of the internal lives of the people. I mean, um, if that was fairly true, then there would be more people with chronic pain in West Virginia than there are people in Bangladesh. So like, you you probably got a point. <laughs> right, that's true, that's true. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I, cities with the lowest suicide rate, how about that? Oh, that's a good one. I would put it far south. That's fascinating. I want to know why you made that prediction, but first let's let's see cities with the lowest. Okay, I'm going to U.S. News and World Report list. That works. That you know what they make lists that I look at sometimes. So we'll give them a strong one here. <laughs> uh, wait, it's by state. I asked for cities. States mm. are too large. Yeah, I know Alaska's got the worst. I'm like 98 percent sure on that the the highest suicide rate that right yeah okay so apparently they only do this by state so we're on worldlifeexpectancy.com all right um okay so wyoming montana and alaska are both in the 30s um i don't know what the the uh, death per 100,000. yeah so yeah so wyoming montana and alaska 32.3 32 yeah, let me just share my screen and then we can look at these together. You want to know something interesting about those three states? What? Those are the three least densely populated states in the United States. Oh, really? In order, Alaska, Wyoming, Montana, if I remember correctly. I know Alaska is the least densely populated, Wyoming is the least populated, and Montana is huge and nobody's there. So I'm like 98% sure, but... I believe those are the three states with the lowest density in the United States. Really, that's fascinating. Um, also, your original prediction about having like high and uh, having low mental health if you're like in a dark place or in a desert seems to line up with suicide rates per state. Um, Wyoming, Montana, Alaska, New Mexico, South Dakota, like all of the, the top five are all like sparsely populated. And, you know, kind of in like more barren areas that are far, I guess New Mexico is not far north, but it is a desert, you know, so. Yeah. It's very stark, nonetheless. Right, exactly. Very stark. That's it. Um, and then like the states with the lowest suicide rate um, per 100,000 people, Delaware, North Carolina, Illinois, Rhode Island, California. Connecticut, Maryland, Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, and Washington, D.C. That is very interesting because New York, New Jersey, Washington, D.C., and Massachusetts, all Northeast. I To me, the Northeast is filled with the least pleasant slash most angry people, yeah. you know? So yeah. <laughs> I guess that they just don't. <laughs> They're fine. I want you, can you look up a, a, a list of states by population density? Because D.C. Yeah. is denser than anything else, and New Jersey is the densest state in America. So that you've got me interested now that the two are, they're on either side. Cool. Uh, let's see if we can't. Okay. Is this okay? You want me to? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because 
I bet you. So let's let's see. Hang on, let me pull this out and then I'll. Okay, hang on. I know how to use computers. I do. Okay, and then other one. Hang on, hang on. Uno momento. See, sí. claro que sí. <laughs> claro que sí. Hey, did you study Spanish in school? For seven years. For seven years, nice. Okay. Yes, señores. Le, pero nunca. Está bien. Nunca usas? Yeah. I yeah. um. <laughs> cool. Okay, so we got them side by side now, and they're both in listy form. That's yeah. like small. Okay. So uh, let's see if I can make it a little bit longer. By the way, to uh, to anybody who does watch this recording, if you see me multiple times going like, it's because uh -huh. I have my work laptop at home with me, not my actual laptop. So this is currently split on my phone. <laughs> I appreciate it. I'm just doing this on my work laptop, which no. I is cool with my company, I think. Um, so that's fine, but I don't know. I, I can't get to my Gmail on my work laptop, so I can't accept the invite. Like, Got it. Okay. <laughs> anyways, brief side note, while I'm staring at the camera every once in a while. <laughs> cool. Um, okay, so why did you want to compare population density to suicide rates? So I'm, I'm curious here, do me a favor, sort it by lowest on the, on the densities. Yeah, that one. Okay. Uh, wait, how do I? Okay. Wait, this is high. This is. Yeah. Yeah, so this I, is lowest. Okay. All right. Uh, in that case, I mean highest. <laughs> the, okay. Uh, yeah. The one that puts highest. the last. Uh, okay. So you interested me because those top three are the same in both of those. And it looks like the top five are the same. Yeah, it does. It in does look like that. Order, but the top five are the same places. Well, that's fascinating. That that definitely is a pattern. So, and if we scroll down, um, New yeah. Jersey is like super super densely populated, and New Jersey also has an extremely low suicide rate. Yeah. Um, Rhode Island, Rhode Island is down here. That's a pretty fascinating correlation that I never would have thought of if I wasn't uh, talking to you, Maryland and Maryland. So what do you what do you attribute this to? Like, what do you think? That's it's it's interesting. See, this is why we consult Billy yeah. on things. He has interesting things to say because he happens to know the top three least densely populated states in the United States. Oops, something. you cut out. Well, he was joking about knowing the least pop densely populated states in the United States. Um, I have no, <laughs> but I do have them memorized. But so this is this is a thing you'll see a lot of places from from what I'm aware of. So as far as least densely populated countries go, like obviously Russia is a, one example in a kind of a way. There's a ton of people in Russia, but there's too much Russia for it to have any density. But if you look at Mongolia is a super interesting example here. In Mongolia, roughly 50% of people live in Ulaanbaatar. Mm. So the actual, the density, like the full together number is very, it's very low. It's one of the lowest. But if you remove the capital city, it becomes like Greenland levels of nobody's there. Wow. And Siberia, the less, the non-densely populated parts of Siberia and a lot of Mongolia have struggled with, with uh, alcoholism is a, is a classic example out of, out of Russia. You know, everybody thinks of, Russian vodka for a reason. Right. It a lot of these things, it seems there's some level of isolation that it just doesn't work with mm -hmm. the like this is this is something I, I learned. So when I did um uh, my my study abroad semester in Scotland, 
I got to go up to uh, to the Highlands, to Ben Nevis, which is the tallest mountain in in Scotland. And I learned something about the Highlands, that the Highlands has an incredibly high rate of suicide on the first year of being there, but not really the same afterwards. Hmm. And from what I was gathering, and, you know, don't, don't quote me on this, but from, from what I was gathering, people who are moving to the Highlands are people from the south of England who want to get away from the south of England. Trying to experience, like, the weather in Brighton and the density of London and moving it to Fort William in Scotland, it's got to be just a wild change in in like lifestyle overall and i think that kind of i think a lot of that has to do with the fact that people are just not there like i i went between all of these these little places these tiny tiny towns and everything is very close together because the country is tiny but it felt like nobody was there in a place that is so much more dense on average than here. It was, it felt empty. And I think mm. that and humans are very clearly social creatures. I don't think you can draw a one-to-one -one correlation between being around people and not committing suicide, obviously, but. Right. I think I think there is just a fundamental aspect that we are social creatures that need to be around social creatures. And the harder you make that, the harder it becomes. <laughs> like the harder right. It becomes. Right. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think that just in my own personal experience, like there's a lot of really shitty emotions. There's a lot of them. But loneliness, it like it never it, it's it's really bad. Like, I think that. I would rather feel guilty or I would rather feel shame than I would feel alone, you know? Like, I, and, and not that I would like feeling guilt or shame, but like loneliness is like, is it, it like kind of causes an existential, like, like feeling like, oh, I'm, I, I don't know. Like, they say that when babies are first born, they think of their mom as like an environment, right? So, like, if you can imagine being an adult human sitting in a garden and then, like, you will, like, make a sound and then, like, the garden will make a sound back at you. Like, that's kind of the experience of being a newborn. And in that way, like, I think that children kind of have their own, like, special, like, internal space where they're kind of the only consciousness present. And then, like, the process of growing up, you you realize that you are one of many consciousnesses. Yeah. Um. So it's it kind of seems to me that like the first experience of human is of being human is to like kind of be alone in the world but that's a, also the first thing that um that like the first milestone is realizing that like other people are also people with consciousnesses. Yeah. Uh, I don't really know where I was going with that except that um I, I think that uh loneliness really sucks, you know. Okay. And, <laughs> I've seen this referred to before. Um, I th it was, I think they called it Sonder. It was like the dictionary of sad words or whatever. And it was the knowledge that everyone around you is living a life as, you know, intricate and complex and meaningful as yours. And I think... Right, right, right. I think there, there's a togetherness in that, but there's also a loneliness in that Everybody is going through their own unique experiences. The fact that everybody is doing it makes it together. The fact that everybody's doing it uniquely is a deep sense of aloneness and not necessarily in a negative way. I think it's loneliness doesn't feel like the right term but a, an awareness of one's aloneness, <laughs> in a way. Right, 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 right. You're talking about, like, um, 
having an existential like positioning where you're like I where you like feel separation from the rest of the world and other beings almost yeah yeah I mean obviously they're they're this is a rather fundamental question as far as you know humans go so there have been a there have been a couple of different ways of thinking of this over time me I'm not <laughs> I'm not a particularly religious person myself. And as part of that, that's another thing where you can find yourself more together and more alone, you know? Because if you don't believe in a God, then in a way you are saying that we are alone. However, if we are alone, then we did this. Then we did everything we have put together. All of the marvels, all of the ills of society are our responsibility. That's a collective humanity has done that thing. Even if that means we're dis we aren't connected to some some greater entity, you know. Even if there's that sense of, of of loneliness in a cosmic sense, if you look at it like the things we've done, the things to be proud of, the things to be ashamed of, if you look at it all through that was our choice, I think that that's the that's the way I tend to think of these things, and I think it it works, it works right better. right so so what you're saying is that when you contextualize all good and bad things that uh, are in our society as like the direct, um, you know, the direct consequence of some prior decision that groups of people made, right? Then we have agency to solve whatever ill in society we're experiencing, right? Yeah. Okay. So I would I would say that that is a pretty um, standard uh, liberal secular viewpoint of humanity, and I think that a lot of people, like I remember, like one of my uh, one of my roommates in college had this poster that was like, it, it was like a, a real middle finger to the Catholic serenity prayer. It was like, uh, I vow to change what I cannot accept, right? Which is like a, a completely, it com the Catholic serenity prayer is give me, dear Lord, give me the wisdom to accept what I cannot change, right? Yeah. And she was like having this like rebellion to that like Christian idea, right? Yeah. So so I I think that, um, human beings uh, with kind of this like cultural rejection of Christianity and religion um, have been able to do a lot of things that are good in society. But I also think that there's a pretty obvious correlation of mental health problems that started like becoming a thing like after human beings stopped going to church, right? Yeah. Um, and I, this is just like my take on it. Um, I think that psychology is not very good at framing um really existential problems like psychology can help you with like normal like like shit but like let's just let's compare like going to a therapist versus like i don't know like your your brother commits suicide like something really heinous happens to you and on the one hand you can go to a therapist but on the other hand like billions of people uh, in the middle east when their brother commits suicide are going to their mosque right and how is that mosque going to help that that person in that situation. Well, you know, in Islam, they have uh, 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 this thing called a fitna, right? Uh, fitna is a test that God has put you through, right? And as you go about, uh, you know, enduring fitnas, he'll send like little, little like good things that will help you, right? Like little blessings and blessings are Rahman. And then as you um, achieve like patience and reliance on God, you'll achieve tawakul or completeness, right? So so what has the um, Islamic framing of, uh, of a negative experience done? Well, one, uh, Islam has helped people contextualize every crappy thing that has happened to them as a test, right? And two, uh, they have told them that uh, the, the tests that God gives you um, 
are things that he knows that you can endure because he created you. And he's going to send you little blessings to help you through it. And that uh, focus on the little blessings helps people hyper fixate on the good things in life as opposed to the crappy things. And then even more importantly, they've told this person the end of the story. Like you are, you're going to think your life is going to come and go and you're going to have tests to see if you can rely on God. But ultimately you can rely on God and you will go home to him at the end of your life. Right. And like taking out religion, just like, just like admire how many people that framing has saved. Like, yep. like what an objectively amazing mental state to be in as you go about living your like shitty little life, right? Like as you, that's, there, there's something in religion that has really helped people endure like, like terrible stuff, you know, terrible stuff. And I can't help but think that like the society where people were still starving to death, like in Jesus's time where like legitimately people just like, like there was not enough food and people would like not eat for two weeks and then they would die. Yeah. Like that society like created a, a method of understanding their world that was religious. And then like modern society happened and starvation stopped being a major issue. And like, you know, like people were still worshiping God when, um, in the early 1900s, because there were still a lot of like really terrible diseases that kind of like made you fear God, you know, like watching, like you could be really rich and like watching someone's like, like, I don't know, um, there's like that one disease where the cartilage between your bones disintegrates. And it was like, I don't know which one it was, but like, it, it made people look really like, like bent over and crappy. And like, that would happen all the time. Right. I, so so like the the amount of terrible things that you have to experience throughout history um, kind of literally put the fear of God in people. And then like as human beings became uh, more and like more advanced, they started taking responsibility for the things that they had and they kind of like stopped almost needing to believe in religion. But I just wanted to point that like what what's your response to my to my comments about religion as a, as a really valuable framing of the internal life. I mean, so, so as, as I, as I said previously, I am not a particularly religious person. So there is, there is a lot of me and this may sound crass that feels like there is an inherent issue with living a comfortable lie. And I'm not even necessarily I don't necessarily firmly hold that conviction. I'm not firmly an atheist, but it feels there's there's a lot of me that's like we shouldn't need to rely on this collective unseen force. We should be able to progress past that. But then should is a very strong word. You know? So do you do you think that there's something wrong with living a comfortable life, not a comfortable lie, but a comfortable life in general? Do you think that that like has taken away from like the the I don't know, like the the, the essence like humanity lived a lot of like experiences and had a, some really good ups and some really, really bad downs. Like, what do you think about living a comfortable life? I think living a comfortable life is if should be if not already is the goal of an advancing society is to create comfort and comfort may not be the best word here but it's it provides you know like no longer having to fear from external factors you know like the odds that i am going to be stabbed with a sword nowadays are far lower than they were 200 years ago True. To a certain degree, it depends on where you are. But um, <laughs> I get this. I I get this sense that we all should be living. Our our collective goal as a species should be to raise the standard of living of that species. Like, and so I absolutely firmly believe that we should be living in comfort 
there's part of me that sticks in finding that comfort in something so esoteric in, in not having something as concrete to base that off of. But, and, and here's the thing, I can, I can say this as much as I want, and I can use all of this logic as much as I want. We wouldn't still be religious if there wasn't a reason. Like, like, there right. would, we would not still be doing this if there was no reason for people to be religious. And I've had this, I've had this specific, this specific thought about the, the situation I could see myself in where I would feel as if there were some kind of, some kind of force beyond me controlling these things. And it is being on a boat in a storm in the ocean. That's like, fascinating. And I totally get it. Tell me more. Like, nowadays, nowadays it's one thing. And obviously things still happen. But you're, you're, you're far less likely, you know, if you run into a bad storm on a carnival cruise ship, it's going to ruin your, like, night. But... And you may be slightly seasick, but then you wake up tomorrow. If it's 1800 and you're crossing the Atlantic and you have to be manning your sails and you have to be standing on masts in lightning storms and there is nothing you can do about it. There is mm -hmm. in the... I don't know why this is stuck in my head so much. It may be because I love the song Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald so much. That's like I love strong, that song too. A strong thing here, but it's <laughs> the fact, and there's no, there is no guarantee that it will end. Like from your experience, at the very least, like it is, storms will always pass. Boats will not always survive them. Right. So. There's this, if, if I found myself in that situation, if I were a little, a little 17th century English privateer just losing his mind out there, I would reach for anything. <laughs> like, right, right. Yeah, if you told me, like, hey, man, if you say, like, Beetlejuice three times in the mirror, spin around in a circle three times, and then jump up and down, and the boat will, not, won't sink, I'd be like, how many times can I do it in a row? Like, <laughs> really. right i mean i oh, sorry go ahead no go ahead That's yeah right. um i okay so a lot of things to say about that the first thing that i would say um is that i think that that is an experience that shows you the awesome power of god and it shows you like how small you are um and i i would say that you are not that far away from like experiencing a natural disaster like that than you think, you know, like I, like <laughs> there's so many jokes on the internet about like the next nuclear war coming. Um, but like the, the, like, I guess that's man-made, right. But this idea that like the, this idea that like um maybe a windstorm will come and it will knock your house down or, or something like that, you know, like, that's not human beings think that they've controlled their environment and in that way they have become their own god but uh the environment is not going to stay controlled by humans you know so yeah. i i think that the thing I, I think that religion kind of makes sense just because um the truth is is that like there are a lot of things that human beings cannot control like windstorms yeah um and then the second thing that I would say is that um, you brought up Mongolia a little bit earlier. So I know that Genghis Khan worshipped the sky. And I also happen to know that um, I, uh, I studied Lakota for like one semester. Yeah. And so I went to South Dakota and um, the skyline was absolutely vast. Right. And it was kind of like standing in the middle of the ocean because you just like saw yeah. for miles and miles until the horizon, right? And it, it was almost like being in the center of the eye 
of, of something, like the center of the eye of the sky, right? And when I saw the flat plains of South Dakota, um, and wherever I walked, I was still in the center of the eye, um, I realized why Genghis Khan would um, uh, worship the sky, you know? And I can, like, that's, like, not really as scary as being in a boat that's about to get shipwrecked. But it kind of is the same experience of, like, awesome power and, like, the vastness of the universe and the, really the smallness of the self. I, in, well, actually, I have an interesting sort of example. And that okay. is, there's a very particular, it's called Jump Off Rock. And it's in North Carolina. And there, the viewpoint from that place is not the most spectacular of any place that I've been. Like, the Blue Ridge Parkway is my favorite place on the planet. Like, I will go to the right. Appalachian Mountains and go drive to the top of the mountain and then drive home, like, the same day. Because I love it. <laughs> but I get this feeling when I'm there, and I've thought this, that if were I to be a pilgrim, let's say, and I've spent my entire life in, I don't know, uh, let's go Plymouth. They took off from Plymouth. That makes sense. Um, it does make sense. Spent my entire life in Plymouth. And then I get to overlook the Shenandoah River Valley, and you see all of the expanse open in front of you but it's it's different it feels different than that what you're talking about in the plains because you're among it you know it doesn't feel like you were it doesn't feel like you're the center of anything it doesn't feel like there is a center of anything it feels like you are it it's a weird level right. of integration with the environment in a super you know super esoteric kind of way but yeah forests tend to make you feel like you're part of something that never ends right yeah especially yeah when you're standing on the bald spot of a mountain and you see right. even that you aren't in the forest, the forest truly never ends. Uh, why do you have a down arrow? Why do you do have I that? Oh, I, I, sorry. Maybe I reacted to something. Maybe I clicked reactions. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's all right. Okay, cool. Um, but, yeah, no, like, I found this interesting now that I have been to, I've always, I've always been a mountain guy. I just, I love being in the mountains. It's my favorite, like, natural place to be. Mm -hmm. And I grew up knowing the Appalachian Mountains the best because I have family in, in North Carolina and have to drive through them to get up to the Midwest. Mm -hmm. But I got to experience the Highlands for the first time when I was over there and I got to experience the Rockies for the first time as well. Mm -hmm. And it just isn't the same. Like <laughs> it's gorgeous. It is absolutely gorgeous. And I'm, I'm not even going to say it's more or less gorgeous than the views of the Appalachian mountains. But when you, when you look upon a Rocky mountain scene, it's like you're looking at a photograph in a mm -hmm. way. Like right. everything is, it's, it's so it's so vast and far away and scale gets super weird when you're out west like mm -hmm. and then the highlands like from a from a geographic sense they are the Appalachian Mountains that's when Pangea split they were mm -hmm. the same mountain range and are now in different spots right but because Scotland is so much further north there aren't trees mm -hmm. like these are they're barren you know, barren's not the right word, because they're, they're covered in lush brown grass. Hmm, right. And that was also interesting. I think it's something to do with sight lines, mm -hmm. in that when I am in the Appalachian Mountains, there will always come a point where something is blocked by a tree. There's always a, a mystery to it. And in, in, in intrigue in these things. If you can completely see the vastness of your of the, of the landscape around you, it can absolutely. It sounds mm -hmm. 
did make me feel similar to what you were describing of being that there is a little sense of agoraphobia within me because there's something really weird about that. And I right. don't know what it is. Right, exactly. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think that landscapes are one of the ways that humans can really come to an experiential term of their own, like, actual smallness on the planet. Because it's difficult to really realize how small you are, like, in the universe, um, just in general, just in general. And I talk about this a little bit in, like, my book. Like, like there are 8 billion people on this planet. And, like, that number is so large that if you tried to count to it, it would take you 500 years to count to it. And that's the number of people that are on this planet, you know. And so it's, it, like, in order to really appreciate that fact, like, I can't because I, I have no, like, visual way of interacting with a number that large. Like, I my brain, like, caps out at around, like, 20. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't visualize any numbers past God. 20. <laughs> yeah. So, so like, the, but I do, I do, like you're describing, have a, a really, really, um, uh, it, like, immediate respect for a landscape that's that large, you know, and, and it is really, it has to do with like the, the, um, the length of the, the view, yeah. you know, like the ability to see until the skyline. So, yeah, it's interesting. Okay. Um, so do you have any closing statements about, uh, why you think that America, um, slash the West in general? Oh, wait, before we did that, I want to say one more thing. Do you think that the highlands in Scotland are characteristically similar to the Appalachian Mountains in terms of culture, um, in terms of the society that lives in the Appalachian Mountains. Because, like, I know that in England they say that the Scots are, like, barbaric, or that, that was the stereotype for a very long time, that the Scots were, like, uncivilized and barbaric. And the Appalachians, like, like in America, we kind of have that same thing. We're like, oh, like, Appalachia is, like, basically, like, a hundred years behind us. Like, yeah. yeah. No, it is not. No. Why? And I say that because there has never been a reason to be in the Highlands. <laughs> like, the people who have been in the Highlands, it's it's not like it's super resource rich. Like, that's not where they mined coal in the UK. They did it down south. Like, right. that's, Wales. that's extracting things from. The soil isn't very good. It's not mm -hmm. easy to build on. Whereas in West Virginia, everybody had a reason to be there, and now they don't. Right. No one in the Highlands ever had a reason to be there. So they're <laughs> like... <laughs> right, right. It's, I've definitely found this. I, it was interesting going between little mountain towns there because it's something that I have very much enjoyed doing in, in West Virginia. I, it is rapidly over the past couple of years become one of my favorite states overall. I think it's gorgeous and it's a fascinating history behind these things, but these are sad towns. Right. And like, not in not in a I'm making fun of them kind of way like right everything left right and the only so, people who are there are people who can't leave see that's what I say about Lansing I say that it's an entire city running on inertia like yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is you can buy a good house like three bedroom two bath for less than 100k in Lansing Michigan which is where uh Billy's and my grandparents lived for a very long time um and and it's like you can the the properties have not gone up at all and like you're trying to buy like any damn house in the south costs like three times that um lansing just has like a great amount of like like civilization that is gone and has no yeah. industry to support it yeah. <laughs> it's still pumping man hey yeah. my my father proud proud uh, hometown of East Lansing, Michigan, I, right. which is different than Lansing. It's very different. Yeah, it has the university, so oh. it's like artificially, artificially inflated because America has put like so much money and federal resources into universities um, as beacons of learning. So it's any university town is like insulated from like the this rest is, of the town. 
that I want to get into because I have been like deeply researching just the whole idea of American land grant colleges lately. Mm-hmm. Like, so I, when I did the semester in Scotland, I went to the University of Glasgow. University mm-hmm. of Glasgow is one of the ancient universities in Scotland. It's, I believe it was 12 or 1400s it was founded. Wow. Yeah, like one of the first ones type deal. It's really cool. Cool. And, and they have this incredible library. And, and it had these, these special collections. Like uh, there's a book called the Scotta Chronic, Chronicon which they had like a special edition of from a very from like 1500s monk type people cool and this library has 2.5 million books it's like wow that's a big old library the university of michigan library has 16 million books indiana bloomington has 7 million books if you were to place the academic resource mm-hmm that America has placed on the University of Wyoming anywhere in Europe, it, it, it's, it's unheard of. And I think it's, it is genuinely one of, one of, if not the greater cultural triumphs of America is the fact that somehow we just really are the best at colleges. Like, mm-hmm. it's just, there's a lot of stuff America says it's the best at, that it is kind of just hanging on to we really do have the best colleges and there's something so cool about that because so many of them are public like, right you know you'll see obviously oxford and cambridge are going to top a list and obviously harvard and princeton are going to top a list but the fact that like ucla is so high mm-hmm. and, and all of these these public colleges with resources and staffs and the like academic clout to do these things if you dropped an average american university into an average european country it would be like the fourth best school in that country right not even necessarily anything against that country it's just where we've chosen to prioritize these things right wow that is that really puts it into perspective that's um fascinating oh so when did the land grant start? Like, why was that? That was like a, a Jefferson thing or? Oh, I can't remember off the top of my head. So I, I went to, I went to Miami, Miami mm-hmm. in Oxford, Ohio, for those of you who were wondering. And um, mm-hmm. that was founded in 1809. Mm-hmm. So that was, I guess that was Madison, barely Madison, but mm-hmm. i I'm curious because that's the second oldest school in Ohio with Ohio University being 1802, I believe. Right. I don't know. I don't think those are technically considered land grant colleges, though. Like when I think of a land grant college, I think of places like, you know, Illinois, Iowa, Michigan, Michigan State, those, the fellas. Right, right. The ones with the football teams. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, um it, it is really fascinating um that America has prioritized colleges so much. I think that that's probably one of the biggest legacies of our founding fathers. Yeah. Um I you know, like I they say that America has like 11 distinct cultures um or there was like there's some book. I, I'll look it up. Uh the like 11 cultures, 11 cultures of America. Uh, yeah, uh, book, book. Um, American Nations, that's the book, and it argues that there's 11 rival regional cultures of America, right? And that the OG one was the Puritans, right? And the Puritans, um, like, really cared about conformity and they cared about education, right? Um, because uh, you had to prove that you were born knowing the word of God, which means that you had to study it really damn well. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) 
which which by the way doesn't make sense that still doesn't make sense to me i have no idea how you get to predestination and i still when i read about puritan theology i'm like i have no idea what you're talking about and and there's like modern calvinists who like still whatever yeah. anyway um so i i think that that like legacy of the puritans is really like just immensely affected the united states uh, and we also have so much wealth because we came, you know, like like we came to a place that had pretty much untapped natural resources. By the way, just like a shout out, apparently um, the reason that there's so much eco-diversity in the Amazon rainforest is because the uh, indigenous peoples of the Amazon rainforest planted plants to make them diverse. The idea was to live um within the ecosystem as it is not to uh like take the resources from it which i think like i don't whatever we we can talk about that in a little while but like between the like scale of wealth that america like took at its founding and the um you know impulse to education our universities are really insane uh so what do you think of like modern criticisms of the American university as like putting people in debt and not teaching people like, like really amazing things. Cause I would say that like, I don't think that my mind was that far expanded in college. Like I, I read some books that I wouldn't have otherwise read, but really what college did for me is it like imbued me with a set of political beliefs that fed into like American, like, like, mm, bureaucracy like I don't know how to say it any other way like like the that like more important than any book that I read what I needed to do was to be a good feminist and care a lot about like 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 liberal social issues and that was the main thing that the university made me do like in my living and in my schooling so what and like I'm not really sure how I feel about like having such an intense political culture. I think that that's true for a lot of American universities. So what do you think about the like politics of universities? So so I come from Miami is an interesting example for this because it is a very conservative school traditionally. And really? Yeah. Um, it is the main attractor to Miami is that the farmer school of business is one of the best business schools around and mm. it is very conservative business school mm. this the kind of people that tended to go to miami were rich white kids just mm -hmm. pretty exclusively rich white kids okay and they were also rich white kids that had never been around non rich white kids okay so and how rich are we talking about so there are definitely different levels to this. Like one of the guys I lived with just had a super nice house. Uh, another guy I lived with walked into our house, saw we had a Keurig and was like, oh, OK, and took his in the box sealed Keurig and just chucked it in the dumpster. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know that much about him. We barely talked. I lived with him for like a semester. I know like three things about the guy. <laughs> if you have Keurig chucking money. <laughs> Uh, there are obvious, there are like Lamborghinis on campus and there are people who drive Bentleys. Mm -hmm. Something about him throwing away that Keurig machine has stuck in my head and will for the rest of my goddamn life. Right, right, right. But, so we have this, there's, there's a very, it's also an incredibly fratty school is the thing. Mm -hmm. So Amy is no- Yeah, guy. your grandma no. was in Tridel at that school, right? was and my grand <laughs> was a pike as was my great uncle <laughs> as <was> my father <laughs> yeah. that's awesome but you didn't rush pike i did not rush pike <laughs> <laughs> cool. i am not i am not cut out for greek life <laughs> <laughs> yeah it also meant something different back then but anyway it's an incredibly fratty school there's a lot of rich white kids at miami and it just it leads to this kind of they're Trump supporters because they think it's funny kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's like they are conservative and there's always an extent to that, but it's this weird, it's this weird combination of 
apathy towards the impacts that things are having, 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 excuse me. Mm -hmm. And also a complete misunderstanding of why any of those things are happening. Right, right. And it, it was fascinating for me to see on the side of like my history people and my geography people, we were all about as hard left as you could get, right? Right. My computer science and business people were all pretty hard right. Mm -hmm. And I found it interesting that there was this like pretty clear division there. And Miami was just not like super socially conscious. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't like outwardly you know, trying to set an example for every other Ohio university for how inclusive it can be. Mm -hmm. It barely has the people to include, like. Right, right. So I I found that super interesting. I I found myself a bunch of of people with similar like-minded opinions on these, these things. Right, right. So that is really interesting. So I went to Emory and Emory is wealthy. Um, yeah. it, I wouldn't say that Emory is known. It, like it, like a lot of people don't know that Emory exists, but um, Emory is really wealthy and it's wealthy enough to get, I think that about a third of the kids who come in are coming in on a substantial amount of financial aid. Yeah. Um, and Emory is actually quite diverse. One, because a lot of the rich kids uh, are international students, right? So you got a lot of like really, really wealthy kids from East Asia who are coming in and they're the ones driving Lamborghinis and stuff. That, what? Yeah. You had that too? Right. Yep. And that was, then. That was the full international population. We're, we've reached a time of day where I'm turning on a light in this room. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. By the way, if you have to go, we can go, but I'm, I have nowhere to be. So if you want to continue talking. I, okay. Uh, I actually do need to go, but also do want to continue talking. Okay, cool. Well, we can also schedule another one of these. Um, so, on. we can do, <laughs> we can yeah, do let's do. We can do this more than once. I would enjoy that. Yes, let's do that more than once. Let's definitely do it. Okay. Um, so, uh, concluding statements. What we learned from this conversation is one: there is an overlap between the population density or lack thereof and the suicide rate of a civilization, which is very interesting. And then two, we learned a little bit about um, the geography of American cultures and their character, and the way that like um, the way that like different regions feel different. And, and then we also kind of talk about uh, the essence of religious experience. And then we got to colleges, but we can't continue. Uh, <laughs> we can't continue. So we'll pick up where we left off. Um, and thank you so much for talking to me. I will talk to you soon, okay? Absolutely, Shell.